David, the symbol of freedom of the Renaissance, the most famous statue in art history. Its creator, Michelangelo Buonarroti, is gifted with talents that enable him to achieve unprecedented things. His art is a beacon of light in the midst of the political and religious feuds of the time. His first great work, the Pietà, already makes him world famous. He understood how the world really is. <laughs> As a sculptor, architect and painter, he shatters norms and breaks taboos. He has no particular respect for popes. He emancipates art from the desires of power. He is a master of anatomy. He uses the understanding of the muscles to create a kind of human drama. A universal genius striving for absolute timeless beauty. Michelangelo was already called Il Divino, the divine, by his contemporaries. What drove the obsessive artist? Two sculptors have tried their hand at this block before you. It's totally beaten up. It's useless. The marble behemoth has been lying on the grounds of the Florence Cathedral Building Lodge for 30 years. Seven meters long, up to two meters wide, and weighing several tons. An unfortunate format on which all before Michelangelo had failed. Too narrow in relation to its length, which increases the risk of the marble breaking. I see greatness. I can see him. The sculptor has already accepted the challenge. He trusts his creative power. You're obsessed. He has an almost erotic relationship with stone. He wants to find the sculpture in the stone, and he is convinced that it's actually already there. Michelangelo Buonarroti will create a sculpture from the colossal stone that will set new standards in sculpture and make him immortal. He's in love with art. It's a deeply passionate relationship. Passion that has its origins in earliest childhood. Michelangelo was a newborn when his father, Ludovico Bonarroti, an impoverished Florentine nobleman, gave him to a wet nurse in the country. This is the custom in aristocratic circles, even if his father can hardly afford it. The little boy enjoys a lot of affection with the stonemason's family and comes into contact with the material that will shape his life. You make it like this, and I will make mine like so. Michelangelo, Michelangelo later jokingly recounts that his fate as a sculptor was shaped by those years when he drank marble dust with his wet nurse's milk. And the rhythm of the hammer becomes his heartbeat. That's very good. Yeah, you're doing it really well. Like me. Just like that. Yeah. He is not yet three when his father brings him back to his parents' house in Florence. These are gloomy times. The Medici banking dynasty dominates the city. Rival noble clans want to seize power from them. Easter 1478, the whole of Florence gathers in the cathedral for mass. My brother and I, we want to bring the best artists to Florence. We want the best art. We want frescoes. We want the best. Among the visitors are the head of the Medici family, Lorenzo, and his brother Giuliano. They are the target of a conspiracy. The Pope is also involved in the plot.
Giuliano bleeds to death. Lorenzo escapes injured and takes cruel revenge. He has the conspirators massacred and their corpses hung from the Palazzo Vecchio for all to see. The young Michelangelo grows up in this atmosphere in Florence, and the atmosphere in his parents' house is no less gloomy. Michelangelo's mother is dead, and his father is left alone with three adolescent sons. He is heavily in debt and has brought ruin upon the once noble family. The father vents his resentment on his sensitive and artistic son. Again, for goodness sake! What on earth is happening here? Oh, really? We're nobles, not riffraff. You shall work, learn, like your brothers and sisters. Michelangelo must have suffered a lot because of his father. He beat him. He actually wanted to prevent him from becoming an artist. He himself tells his own story as one of resistance against this paternal violence. That's important for him. At the same time, he can never get away from the man. It will remain a love-hate relationship throughout his life, perhaps spurring his love of art even more. A copper plate engraving by Martin Schongauer fascinates the 12-year-old Michelangelo in particular. He takes it as a template and transforms it, inspired by nature. The fish scales become the demon's garments. The temptation of St. Anthony is the only surviving painting of his childhood and already shows his extraordinary talent. Michelangelo has painted it in tempera, added color, and we can see that he tightened the group so the figural group is like a sculpture in the space of the painting so that all our attention goes to the figures. The strong plasticity of the composition already evinces the budding sculptor. Carmen Bambach researches Michelangelo's art at the Metropolitan Museum in New York. Her colleagues were also able to look under the layers of paint of the childhood painting. We're looking at the painting in natural light on the left, and on the right, we're looking at the painting in infrared reflectography. And for me, what was really interesting was to really think about the vocabulary of these little stick figures that appear in the underdrawing in comparison to the drawings by Michelangelo on paper. You see the same kind of quickness and this is a kind of technique of figural abbreviation that Michelangelo uses throughout his career. Importantly, we see that this is part of his language of sketching. A sketching language that he would master in Florence. He grows up in a time in which the ideals of antiquity blossom anew and humanism places mankind at the center. An intellectual movement promoted by the Medici Lorenzo de' Medici is both a despot and an admirer of beauty. He collects ancient art and supports talented artists. Thus his court becomes the cradle of the Renaissance. His art agent discovers the talented Michelangelo. Ciao. Ciao. Against his father's will, he learns the marble craft in the Medici workshop, following the models of antiquity. And just as a small child, he is captivated by the white stone. That's going to be rubbish when it's finished. What do you want from me? Has his talent aroused the envy of his classmates? Or has he provoked them with his peculiar temperament? Idiot. His nose is broken during a scuffle. From then on, he feels disfigured. He was passionately attracted to beauty. And you know, that's why I think Michelangelo suffered a lot from being so ugly. The supposed flaw will weigh on him for the rest of his life. 
and is perhaps one of the reasons why he avoids people all his life and devotes himself entirely to art. When his patron Lorenzo de' Medici dies, Rome becomes a refuge for Michelangelo. The eternal city with its ancient monuments, this is his world. The art scene takes notice of him, and soon he receives a unique commission from a French cardinal. He is to carve the mother of Jesus, a life-size pieta with the body of Christ. What a challenge for the 22-year-old artist. Unlike in painting, where corrections are possible at any time, in sculpture, every stroke with the chisel has to be spot on. He concentrates exclusively on his work. He hardly eats, he doesn't sleep, he doesn't go out. Michelangelo devotes all his strength to the work. He knows that it requires his whole life. Nothing else exists for him. The pressure weighs heavily on him. The statue is to be the most beautiful marble work of art in Italy. In view of the abundance of antique statues in Rome, this is a bold demand from his client. We have letters from his father, who was very concerned about the dire conditions under which his son was working. He had been told that the boy was locked up in a hovel to work on this sculpture. The torments Michelangelo suffered are apparent in one of his poems from that time. Only I am solitary in the shadows, whereas other men take their pleasure. I do but mourn, prostrate on the ground, lamenting and weeping. Meanwhile, in Florence, the world of humanism is under threat. Michelangelo's source of inspiration and the protective framework for his artistic creation. The fanatical monk Savonarola now rules the city. He has works of art destroyed and humanist books burned as the devil's work. Protected from the destroyers of his values, Michelangelo holds fast to humanist ideals in faraway Rome. With this sculpture. For two years, he works almost incessantly on his vision of the Virgin Mother with her dead son. His Pieta is a sensation among his peers. Maria is unlike the traditional figure of a woman bowed in grief. And Christ on her lap is not a typical man suffering with pain. Nothing on the spotless body is marked by mortal agony. The veins on his hand are plump, as if pulsating with life. No artist has dared to portray the theme in this way ever before. Mary and her son touch us with their divinity, above all through their beauty. This stark juxtaposition of suffering and death on the one hand, and aesthetic beauty on the other, it's something that just convinced people instantly, we are looking at something special here. This process, this torture while working, is of course also visible in the result. That's what makes this art so incredibly powerful. The Pieta is the only work Michelangelo ever signed. After that, he no longer has to. He is world famous. He sends the lavish fee to his father, but keeps almost nothing for himself. But he remains lonely despite his success. Already then, Rumors circulated about his love life. He writes many love poems, and all of them are about unhappy love. Oh, the lovers flee, flee from the fire of love. 
The wild fire doth rage terribly and deadly once the flames burn. Neither strength nor reason nor flight will help thee. His biographers, especially Condivi, construct this idea of a Michelangelo who only loved beauty platonically and suppressed his homosexuality. But in reality, Michelangelo fulfilled this passion. In the Renaissance, sexuality was lived very concretely. During his time in Florence, Michelangelo wants to explore the human body in detail. At night, he steals into the Santo Spirito mortuary to dissect corpses. Dr. Plackinger, Andreas Fesalius. Many thanks. Andreas Plackinger has analyzed the significance of dissections in Michelangelo's work and studied their role in Renaissance science and art. Here we see an anatomist at work. He has placed his hand on the open corpse and is giving explanations. Michelangelo was also famous as a master anatomist, and this fascination with the human body and its anatomy, which was of course visible to contemporaries, naturally also led to people asking how these works came about. Anatomists were quite often accused of corpse theft and murder. For example, it is reported of Michelangelo, this is of course a rumor, that he killed a man in order to be able to depict a perfect Christ on the cross. That is, he nailed his model to the cross. What fascinated him most about anatomy was the nature of the musculature. He knew exactly where each muscle was located and, typical of his time, began to make scientific records of the human body. Michelangelo obtained the flawless block of marble for the Pietà from the quarries of Carrara. Today we can still observe what a feat it was to extract the precious stone. The problem with marble is the cracks. Customers want large blocks, but such a mountain of marble is crisscrossed by millions of natural cracks. And only sometimes, between four cracks, it's possible to quarry blocks of the required size. It takes the diggers several days to break a block out of the mountain along four natural cracks. Then the blocks are cut with diamond wires. The problem is, no one can predict whether the blocks you break out will be big, robust, and without defects. I always have this risk, even today, despite new technology. From excavation to transport, today the workers in the Carrara marble quarries have modern machinery at their disposal. In Michelangelo's day, and well into the 19th century, Workers excavated even the largest blocks out of the mountain using only a hammer and chisel. Then they slid the marble down to the valley on wooden sledges and pulled it with ox teams to the harbors by the sea. In 1501, Savonarola had been hanged in the meantime, Michelangelo returned to Florence at his father's insistence. Watch out! Watch out! The citizens of the city have a very special commission for him, a biblical figure for the cathedral. Hence, they carry the colossal block to him, several tons in weight and seven meters high. It takes the men four days to erect it. It's unimaginable what would happen if it were to crack. These were also dimensions that had been used to represent gods in antiquity. And that's where he saw his chance. He wanted to measure himself against the great works. Michelangelo has a high wooden fence built around the block as a screen, 
for fear of spies and the theft of his ideas. He planned something highly unusual for the time. It would be possible to walk all the way around his David. The freestanding statue is also a sign of human freedom and self-determination. It is essential to the Renaissance philosophy, and it also emphasizes the impression of the monumental. Once again, Michelangelo works like a man possessed. His contemporaries report that he even goes to bed with his boots on. He uses every second to contemplate his sculpture in advance, so that no miscalculated blow destroys the work. Franco Cervietti knows how to work with marble like no other. He makes copies of the most famous works and has carved all of Michelangelo's sculptures out of marble in their original size, including David six times in total. In order not to ruin it, you have to understand that you have to envision the sculpture in the block with its dimensions. You have to measure it before you knock something away. You see, even if it's only roughly chiseled here, you can already see a little of the line, the form. Only then can you understand whether you can strike deeper or not, and then you have to measure again. A marble sculpture can only be created with a lot of experience, intuition, and a feeling for the inner life of the stone. Every time I have a block of marble like this in front of me, I realize that no two are the same. Each block has a different quality. That is what makes it special. You have to know how to shape marble with a steady stroke and with the right tool. Then it comes alive. I've been doing this work all my life. It has become my fulfillment, my passion. You can live without marble, but I'm happier with it. Despite the effort, the hard physical work is also exhilarating. Sometimes Michelangelo writes poetry about it. The hammer that chisels a human figure out of the hard stone must bend my will. But it is God's will that guides my hammer to create the magnificent. The unveiling of David is a triumph. An anatomically perfect body as an expression of the freedom and sovereignty of the spirit that knows no subjugation. Michelangelo's David need not fear any Goliath. People were simply overwhelmed. They hadn't seen anything like this before. It was new in this gigantic size. An Apollo like David, who also had the strength of a Hercules. He's virtually the symbolic portrait of this young city that doesn't want to submit to the Medici, that doesn't want to submit to any ruler, to any emperor. He was a humanist through and through, and you see that in David. He doesn't show the brutal act itself against Goliath, but what he shows is reflection. His act is planned, despite his physical beauty and the strength he radiates. And that is the ideal that Michelangelo wants to see embodied. Michelangelo an artist with divine inspiration and little ingenious ideas. If you look closely, you can see this little heart on the eye, for example. You see, a little heart has been chiseled into it. Or here, in the hair. He has carved small holes in it that create a very special effect when they're seen from a distance. That's why his works are so special. Not everyone makes works like this. The look of David, the look of the man 
who kills Goliath. This is a strong man. Even if he's smaller than the giant Goliath, he stands for strength and youth. And by emphasizing these things from a distance, they give the figure and the face of David an impression of more movement and more power. David has become immortal. And whether it's everyday culture, pop culture or advertising, people like to play with David and his ideal body. 500 years before, a new pope summons the famous sculptor from Florence to Rome again. Pope Julius II wants 40 sculptures as magnificent as David for his tomb. Michelangelo spends months breaking 40 marble columns out of the mountain himself. But then the Pope changes his mind. The artist should rather paint the vaulted ceiling of the Sistine Chapel with the 12 apostles. Michelangelo is furious. All that preparatory work for nothing. Besides, he is a sculptor, not a fresco painter. A very significant dispute with the Pope ensues. Because Michelangelo negotiates with a client for the first time with the most powerful client of all. The dispute escalates. And then he said, 12 apostles, that's a poultry request, I want more. You might think, OK, now you're an artist and the Pope is the Pope. He's actually in charge, so you should really show your willingness to compromise. But Michelangelo was not willing to compromise. Looking for trouble is what you say today. And Michelangelo gets his way, a ceiling fresco entirely according to his ideas. In place of a resplendent starry sky, he now wants to paint none other than the creation story. Michelangelo is the first artist aware of the value of his art. This awareness leads him to place himself on, today we would say, almost equal footing with the Pope. Such insolence. You're too slow. Especially as the sculptor has hardly any experience with the fresco technique. Look after the colors. What's more, his client's expectations are immense. The Sistine Chapel is one of the most highly consecrated rooms in the Vatican. It's a gamble for the Pope to commission such a difficult painting from a sculptor who basically feels like a sculptor. But it's also a gamble for Michelangelo to accept the commission. He enlists the help of fresco painters from Florence, but he soon dismisses them again. Michelangelo is portrayed as someone who is a loner, who does not work well in a team at all. In fact, he wants to do everything himself. He begins with the flood. But he quickly fails due to his inexperience. The fresco becomes moldy. Michelangelo has to chip it all off. And start again. In a moment of difficulty, he wrote to his father, it's my fault because I was too presumptuous. It's not my job, but I wanted to do something I was not able to do. The added pressure to complete the work does not ease his self-doubt. It is said the impatient Pope threatened to push him off the scaffolding if he did not finish soon. Michelangelo is certainly an artist who struggles. Once he made a drawing about how hard the work was, having to paint the figures overhead all the time. He also struggled with the techniques until he found the ideal form. And he finds it quickly. He uses the raw plaster as a color surface with virtuosity. That saves time. 
In Michelangelo's hands, the fresco progresses quickly. Then, within a few months, Michelangelo becomes in fact the greatest fresco painter in the world. He will create a fresco the likes of which the world has never seen before. At the center of the creation story, God creates Adam. A hymn to man in the image of God, his contemporaries rave. God's not an oversized God the Father who creates a little Adam, but the two are at finger level. So one inspires the other. It happens together. It happens in dialogue. The fingers are not touching each other. It's simply the pointing finger, the idea that is transmitted. Man is God's image, but that also makes him independent and autonomous in a way. For almost 500 years, the fresco has captivated people. Even those who see it almost daily cannot escape its effect. Guido Cornini has the privilege of being able to enjoy the pictures undisturbed, even in the evening. This frame above me, showing the creation of man with his hands meeting, is Michelangelo's greatest iconographic invention, because it shows the divine spark passing through man's life. So, the creature that comes to life from the very hands of God. Barbara Giatta, the director of the Vatican Museums, is also very close to Michelangelo's works every day. She is particularly fascinated by his gift for thinking in perspective. We must realize that he was working on a scaffold, or in any case at a very close distance, and therefore had to imagine the view from the ground. Since the boards on which he painted prevented him from seeing from below, Michelangelo was left only with his imagination to picture himself in the situation of the viewers 20 meters below. In this, he benefits from his skills as a sculptor. This is impressively apparent in a tiny detail of the fresco, Adam's foot. In Adam's case, he has prepared the fresco in great detail with engravings in the plaster. Only the foot deviates from this. Instead of sticking to the pre-drawn engraving line, he enlarges the foot so that it has the right proportions for the viewer below. But proportions are not the only challenge. To compose a virtuoso overall work on 540 square meters of wall space requires good organizational skills. But how? When most of the figures are already emblazoned on the ceiling, Michelangelo has a brilliant idea. He structures the ceiling with deceptively real architectural elements, columns, for example, which he embellishes with naked youths, the Inudi, angels from the creation story. Originally, they were supposed to have wings, but he omits them. Instead, he stages them with perfect human bodies. And with human poses and gestures. May I? And something else is striking. They're androgynous, that is, they're just as God created man in his image as man and woman. That is why they have male bodies and sometimes very feminine, graceful faces. That is the likeness to God. Androgyny was one of the aspired ideals of the Renaissance. Androgyny was considered divine. In heaven, as it says in the book of Matthew, there are neither women nor men. This is good. What is also striking about the Inudi is the movement of their bodies. This makes them appear almost weightless and adds an air of self-assurance to the display of strength. When we look at both Michelangelo's sculpture and his painting, we realize that these are not natural proportions. The beauty of Michelangelo's painting and sculpture lies in the exaggeration of anatomy. 
How he perfects his physiques is apparent in his preparatory study for the Libyan Sibyl, which is also part of the ceiling fresco. Every time that I look at this drawing, I feel that I can look at it again and again and again and find new things. And here, for example, we see the muscles tensing underneath the skin, creating these fantastic patterns that seem so dramatic about the figure. It's as if the musculature becomes the protagonist of the body and the image that is being depicted. He uses the understanding of the muscles to create a kind of human drama, to create a sense of tension, and there is a certain beauty in the patterns of the muscles. Michelangelo thus gives his figures a unique presence in space. He makes the bodies practically tangible. Of course, his figures are still very much based on sculpture, but that lends itself very well to this fresco because it puts the human body right at the center. And it's a celebration of being human, of the human body, also of creation itself, which he creates there on the ceiling. The ceiling fresco is finished in four years. It's a triumph. Michelangelo attains the aura of the painter of God. Since then, the Sistine Chapel has attracted visitors from all over the world who want to get a closer look at his frescoes. Up to seven million art enthusiasts surge through the chapel every year. However, the air they breathe damages the frescoes, which were lavishly restored in 1982. The conservators are responsible for the atmospheric environment of the fragile interior. It is important that the amount of CO2 that the visitors emit into the air in the room, the conservation of the chapel is, after all, dependent on the number of visitors, that this amount should not exceed a certain value. We therefore have 10 sensors that measure the airflow and air circulation in the chapel. We also have sensors that measure the CO2, sensors that measure the air particles, and sensors for the ozone content. The data is transmitted to the control center and constantly evaluated. This diagram shows us how the number of visitors is increasing, but the CO2 still does not exceed the limits, and it also shows us the amount of dust. This is ensured by a special filter and circulation system. The Sistine Chapel has a volume of 10,000 cubic meters. With a high visitor frequency, our system can renew the air up to 60 times a day. In addition, the Sistine Chapel is inspected once a year and the frescoes cleaned. Michelangelo is already a legend in his own lifetime. His hometown of Florence overwhelms him with commissions, but war breaks out. The exiled Medici want to reconquer the Republic. Michelangelo once promoted by the Medici, now their opponent, designs bastion towers for the old fortress. The Medici army and their imperial allies are not able to take the city for a long time. The Republic eventually falls after an eight-month siege. David's creator flees to Rome and will never return. He is now almost 60 and moves back to the center of antiquity the part of the eternal city whose monuments and figures have always particularly inspired him. Although Michelangelo had amassed an enviable fortune, he remained in the simple, very modest, almost poverty-stricken house all his life. And this despite the houses he had bought in Florence, despite the lands he had bought for his family. In Rome, he will discover a new spiritual awakening. He meets Vittoria Colonna, the deeply devout Roman princess and celebrated poet. 
She is the great love of his life. He writes ardent love poems to her. It torments him that love should remain platonic. O oh, thou doth sweeten my fate at last, my old heart from death doth shield, and hope eases the pain that wounds me with violent longing. Only death's nearness prevents Cupid's desire. Vittoria Colonna gathers church reformers around her, the Spirituali, who sympathize with Martin Luther. They believe in the pure power of divine light. Light is man's direct relationship with God, without institutional mediation. The Inquisition will accuse Vittoria Colonna of following a faith that does not recognize the mediation of Mary or the saints, but turns directly to Christ. This was a problem for the Inquisition, because the power of the Church of Rome was based on its cult of mediation and intercession. The masses were paid for, the relics were paid for. For Michelangelo, however, this was not the true faith. What counts is a kind of inner enlightenment that enables us to be in touch with God and thus find a kind of personal salvation. This is the beginning of something completely new. Twenty-five years after completing the ceiling, Michelangelo returns to the center of the Catholic Church with this new spiritual belief. Although the Pope knows about his critical attitude towards the Church, he commissions him to design the altar wall of the Sistine Chapel with the Last Judgment, and Michelangelo will use the commission to express his vision of the end of the world. Like an action film director, he stages almost 400 naked bodies between resurrection, heaven and hell around Christ the judge. The great novelty is that this judgment is a vortex in which it is not clear what one should do to go one way and not the other, precisely because there is not only one side to good and one side to evil. It is the first last judgment in which the cards are deliberately shuffled. Michelangelo does not distinguish between the damned and the redeemed. No one is spared. That is the difference to earlier judgment portrayals, that even the saints have to face the judge stripped and naked. And that was a scandal. No monk's robes and no royal robes can protect them. Only the judge decides. The last judgment is certainly no picnic. It's a dramatic affair. I go to heaven and my neighbor doesn't, or vice versa. There's drama here, and that's why you can express it through an aesthetic ideal of dramatic figures. And many of Michelangelo's contemporaries also accepted this and went out amazed and said, right, this is how it has to be done. Michelangelo creates his very own dramatic vision of heaven, and above all, of hell. <laughs> Those who are damned. are dragged down by the henchmen of the underworld. We can assume that Michelangelo was deeply obsessed with the idea of the agony of death and eternal life, which gave him a sense of bewilderment, that sense of eternity changing forever. And that is what we observe in the fresco. It is a fresco of enormous drama. Michelangelo worked on The Last Judgment for five years. Five years in which he again devoted himself completely to his work, to the point of physical and mental exhaustion. And once again, he paints demons. His own, perhaps.
He places the mouth of hell directly above the altar table where the Pope celebrates Holy Mass. He has witnessed 11 popes, all of whom swindled the faithful. Does he want them to burn in hell for that? And he immortalizes himself on the altar wall. On the flayed skin of the martyr Bartholomew. When he depicts himself in the Last Judgment in the Sistine Chapel, then that is, of course, an indication of a large ego, immortalizing himself on the altar wall. And in a way, it's a contradiction. This ego that promulgates itself in this fresco, and at the same time, if you like, he possesses humility. With the Last Judgment, Michelangelo is not only dedicating himself to his work, he is also documenting his very own deeply felt faith. Man is not saved because he follows the precepts of the church, but because he behaves in a certain way in relation to God. This is a call to personal responsibility. The whole Last Judgment is an attack on the church. And the church certainly perceived Michelangelo's criticism, even though it has to live with the fresco to a certain extent. A newly elected pope approaches him and says that he should please paint over the naked bodies in the Last Judgment so that everything looks decent. And he replies, Holy Father, I'll be happy to do that. Just one little thing. Make the world a decent place, then the pictures will be decent too. Michelangelo's criticism of the church does not harm him. Pope Paul III is so taken with him that he entrusts the now 72-year-old polymath with supervising the construction of the largest building site in Christendom, which has already swallowed up vast sums and become a huge building scandal, St. Peter's Basilica. The status of being the master builder of St. Peter's naturally gives his life a new dimension. That is, he suddenly has the task of bringing something to completion that his colleagues had completely failed to do. He designs the highest unsupported dome in the world. A dome is actually also a sculpture, if you like. And when you look at the dome with the ribs and also with the windows, it has a sculptural quality. Michelangelo is not deterred when a new pope persecutes the church reformers, cuts his salary and stops the construction of the new cathedral. Another pope, another time, will soon come. He did not live to see the completion of the dome, but it was built almost exactly according to his design. Today it is the landmark of Rome, the landmark of Christianity. Sunlight floods the church interior through 16 huge windows, a theatrical staging of the divine light that his great love Vittoria so adored. On the 18th of February, 1564, Michelangelo died of a fever at the age of 89 in his simple home near the ancient forums. Michelangelo was very robust until his death. He worked, sculptured, and rode around Rome on horseback. Imagine an 89-year-old man riding through Rome on his horse. That's how an eyewitness reported it. And he looked very good for his age, because he'd been physically active all his life, and because art was his life. He worked right up until his last day. He destroys a large part of his drawings, as if no one should know the efforts and detours that went into creating his works. Michelangelo chose the city of Rome to live and die in, the city that paid him the greatest tribute and to which he gave works of timeless beauty.
Non era interessato. He was never interested in worldly things or in the world of others. He had such an extraordinary world of his own. The polymath, who was so strict with himself and faced his struggles throughout his life, could also be humorous. On the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, for example, he created a very lively god from behind with a pert bottom. But perhaps what distinguished him most was that he always followed his own will. That's what makes his art so free and so strong and so dazzling to this day. He dedicated his life to the search for reality, for truthfulness, for the soul of things, and thus also for the eternally enduring. Michelangelo is the first person who can be said to have been truly revered like a god. 